Hey listeners, this is a podcast written by Software Engineer. I'm Perry Tsu, Software Engineer and Engine Manager, and on this episode I get to talk to Jennifer Perota, Chief Technology Officer at WeWork. She shares so many great stories on what makes her who she is today, and I can't wait for you guys to hear them. As usual, make sure to follow the podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All the links are shared at paritsu.com slash podcast. If you'd like to check out podcasts written by Software Engineer Merch, they are available at paritsu.com slash shop. On to the show. Enjoy. Welcome back to another episode of a podcast written by Software Engineer. I'm your host, Perry, and today we have the absolute pleasure to have Jennifer Perot on the show. Jennifer is CTO of WeWork. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. No, it's, it's a pleasure, <laughs> not just for me. I feel like I speak for everybody on this show, which <laughs> I really shouldn't at the end of the day. But no, it's something that I'm really excited about because, of course, having gotten the chance to work with you and just see how you think about problems and look at problems and how it affects so many people around you, that's something that why I keep on saying that I, I'm so lucky to be able to like poke at your brain a little bit about that, sorry. Um, but even before we dive into all the fun topics, as a, I guess as a general, like, who is Jen? Uh, like a 30 second blurb, <laughs> like, how would you, des- you describe Jen at the end of the day? Wow, um, okay, so 30 second blurb. So um, let's see, I love being on the water. So I am a jet skier at heart um, and I grew up in Jersey. Um, my email address is Jersey. No way. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I love my uh, my home state of New Jersey, and yeah, I've just um, I've had such a, a, a wonderful um, so, so many wonderful experiences all over the world. So who is Jen traveling, hanging out on a jet ski, and just you know being me? No, that's great, <laughs> Jersey Jen. Jersey Mike, Jersey, all the other ones out there. <laughs> oh, that is so, so, so fun. But I'm already glad you brought up in terms of like hometown and influences because that's mm-hmm. something that I absolutely love hearing from guests all over the place in terms of you do stuff day to day because you have so much behind you, so much history behind you and everything. So I think to really just kick it off in terms of like your hometown, New Jersey, my question would be, how techy was it? Obviously, it's a tech shot at the end of the day. Like, what what, do you remember from that? Um, So the mayor of our town, very small town, Carlstadt, New Jersey in Bergen County, um, owned a software company. And my father worked at AT AT&T. Um, and he was uh, in QA. He was a tester. That's pretty much as techy as you got in my town. We weren't one of those schools that had, you know, the the devices when you were in grammar school or high school at all. Um, but we had some folks, you know, in the town that were techy. No, that's great though, because even <laughs> even thinking about like the composition of a town, most of the time, like even the neighborhood I grew up is like, oh, that person works in plumbing. That person works in that. And then once you discover those kind of niches. But also when we're talking about uh, just growing up in a neighborhood that, yeah, you already have some good influence in terms of like somebody working at ETNT and then all that. So in your childhood, in terms of like these individuals that are close to you worked in tech, what was that relationship look like influence? Like how much did you learn from it very early in your life? And yeah, just reminiscing about that. Yeah, I, um, I always remember in my basement, my dad was always tinkering. Right. I remember in my mind, I see circuit boards right all over the basement. Right. <laughs> and then uh, the mayor of our town, you know, just going back to him as well. He had a private jet that he used to go to his <laughs> company um, every day. And he flew out of Teterboro Airport. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, that's one heck of a commute. Right. So we had my dad in the basement, you know, playing on, at nights and on the weekends and him taking a commute, you know, up and down the Jersey Turnpike and, you know, my, our mayor flying in his private jet. So I think the commute to work um, to these jobs was something that was always in my mind. So it's like an interesting, you know, it's an interesting correlation. Yeah, I, I, I'm already jealous in terms of like that exposure. Not that I haven't <laughs> seen any plays when I was a kid, but in terms of being that much closer on it. And even when you mentioned in terms of like circuit boards, what did what did you understand out of it to begin with? Or did and, you, you just know, know that your dad? Initially, I I, I didn't. You know, he was down there. You know, he was just he was doing his thing. He had his books out, and you know, I, I was very fortunate in, in in the house because he has a very um, teaching mindset. Mm-hmm. So everything that he was doing, he would walk me through. Of course, if I was interested, right? Depending on the age that I was, <laughs> and you know, his patience really helped me. I think become the type of manager and leader I, I want to be, you know, and, and, and am today because, you know, I really learned a lot about taking the time to teach the things that you're interested in to anybody that wants to learn. 
Yeah, I mean, even the word screaming teaching, like, I see where it comes from, like, in terms of, like, <laughs> if that wasn't self-explanatory enough, just by going back to the fact that I've learned so much from you just day to day, so I definitely do want to, I keep on saying it's a goal for myself, even, to reciprocate a lot of it, where it's, like, at some point, the life is just too big to, to, to not be sharing that kind of stuff. So. I think that's one of the, the best life lessons, if I could get a little bit philosophical for a moment, right? Because it's, it's so important for everyone that learns something to just pass it on. And I don't think we do enough of that anymore, but I'm starting to see it more and more, and it just makes me so happy to hear you say that. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> but if I get the chance to geek out even more, uh, one thing that I love hearing is when we talk about these circuit boards and everything, there's a kind of like tangible stuff that people play with uh, mm -hmm. during their childhood. For example, for us, I mean, on the software side, growing up, we, we played like Roller Tours and Tycoon. And then we had like Tamagotchis, which are like small little, little gadgets on that. But I guess from, from your, your past in terms of, was there any memorable like, technology or gadgets that were present uh, you're playing with or you just oh, geez. had hands on? I'm going to probably date myself, but I remember the day that we got uh, Commodore 64. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I guess more importantly, which was probably, geez, the early 90s by the time we got one, but I remember getting one of the first compacts and then playing Oregon Trail with my friends. Oh my God. And remember, back at that time, you actually, you know, you actually were able to enter the code to have the wagon go to the next place that you wanted it to go, right? And it was it was such a fun, fun experience. It almost feels like a full circle sometimes because you're saying like so so low level, so like so into the code yeah. doing all that. There are games out there nowadays that are kind of coming back to that sense where it's like, oh, just plug these code in, these commands in, and yep. then your character is going to do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. So that is such a good like bit of time, like a, a piece of time in there mm -hmm. that, that really It always comes it. back full circle, right? Just like fashion. <laughs> <laughs> but then on that front, like as those evolve, like I'm sure you have a, a bunch of collection of different gadgets, tools, technologies, all the kind of, kind of fun stuff, sorry. You mentioned the Commodore 64. Would you consider, I guess, that like the first time you had access to like a computer or like something that is a smarter device? Like, Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I think it was back then. And then, you know, that was also when fancy calculators were starting to get legs. Right, so I think that that was the first time that I had to interact with devices, computers, and things that had brains. Yeah, the calculators, <laughs> like the ones that could draw like a graph, like a Graphic calculus, calculator. like derivative thing on yeah. there. Yeah. We took those for granted. It's like that was so funny, and at least I'll speak from my experience from, from math in high school. It was like, sure, get your parents to pay like what 120 bucks back then to get then, one of those, yeah. and then use it. Expensive. And then there's that one kid who will always manage to play Doom on it or like just run like Pokemon on that. So, oh man, so many fun, relatable technology at the end. But um, in terms of tinkering on the Commodore 64, I feel like I always ask about this, that like my vivid memories with computers is obviously like you have the mouse. Even back then, a lot of it is like terminal at the same time. And it's like it's very different from people's perspective. Um, do you remember what did you gear to your, your towards immediately in terms of, I don't think there were videos on there, I don't think there were like images, I don't think there were like text, like what, what was the stuff that screamed at you? It, it reminds me of an Etch-a-Sketch. Right, right. Right, it reminds me of Etch-a-Sketch and I remember the, um, how, how the, the click of the keyboard and how hard you had to press to get the keys down. Oh. Those are the two things I remember. I remember the screen was like an Etch-a-Sketch and like actually pressing down on the, the console on the keyboard, it was very hard. It's it's a feature nowadays. Yeah. People with the mechanical keyboards are like, yeah, yeah, there's keyboard. someone with one here. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, there's always an origin of something, mm -hmm. origin of story on that. But mm -hmm. I think it's so so fun. But surely during that time as well, you did a bunch of education, a lot of school, and mm -hmm. that's one of the things that um, a lot of people have different experiences throughout. Um, one thing that uh, I personally think about a lot is when I was in school, did I always think about going into tech? Was it like an obvious glaring thing where it's like, oh, that's the goal, that's the end game. So for you, in terms of like, was it always obvious that you wanted to go into tech during that, that time of your life? So no, so I went to Boston College and I went on an athletic scholarship to play softball there. So mm -hmm. I was really fortunate to be able to do that. And the um, when I got there, um, we weren't really supposed to at, because we were scholarship athletes, we weren't really supposed to have jobs, but I always had one and I wanted one. So naturally, where did I get a job? I got a job at the computer lab. Oh, right. Okay. So, you know, it would open at 6 a.m. I would work from 6 to 9 and I would, you know, whoever were the early birds that were up in the computer lab, I would either help them or just, you know, which would be fun or just swipe their badge in, right? Um, so it was always like a part of my life, even at college. But I, I only declared my major after taking a robotics class. 
Hmm. I really liked the instructor. I, I took the robotics class. I really enjoyed it. And those were the, you know, that was Java and C++. <laughs> and um, that's when I declared my major. So that was late sophomore year. So I declared quite late. Um, and then my junior year had an internship at, at IBM and everything kind of took off from there. And I was really, I knew that that was going to be my career. Yeah, it's it's fun how you, everything you've mentioned is like it's piecing it together, right? It's like it's not it's not a big sign with like Las Vegas lights that says like <laughs> oh that is what you're doing, and that, and it's so relatable because everybody has this similarity where it's like somehow you just keep on following these different these different passions and these different fun things to do. Working at a computer lab, mm -hmm. I haven't had never had the opportunity, but I'm sure you had a bunch of stories. Or maybe do you remember anything crazy that happened in there? Or anything that was just like memorable? That oh, jeez, that that was you know there were a lot of a lot of <laughs> kids would stumble in after being out all night to get their paper done before they wanted to take a nap Classic. at noon. No, so there's a lot of those stories. I also remember the first day that the 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 Macs were delivered that were now in different colors. Mm. So I remember how that like lit up <laughs> the lab. Literally. Yeah, and I also <laughs> it's funny. I also remember that when I first started working, it was very small. Um, and um, then it, my probably two years in, maybe my end of my sophomore year, early junior year, they completely took over a whole floor. Oh, wow, yeah. And then there was, you know, the, the lab was, was massive, and then there started to be, like, little mini R&D labs in the corner, and it turned out it, almost into, like, a hangout instead of a place to do work. That is always fascinating. I'm just going to go on a random tangent. I, um, I have a friend who... Before coming to the States, uh, he was building computer labs for like different education system hmm. like in his home country. And it was kind of a similar story where it's like somebody just has to like build these labs and the next thing you know it's like it just grows bigger and bigger. Like it's easy to take it for granted. It's yeah. easy to walk into all these fab like facilities that have like crazy stuff, but even back then I think about it. Yeah. It's always, always fun. Yeah. Um, and just so that I'm not being dumb over here, your major ended up being computer science. Computer science, yeah. That's so fun because, um, I mean, speaking of experience, I did do comp sci as mm -hmm. well. But the thing is, like, it's different. Not only different schools. I didn't go to B. I went to McGill at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but just different time of people taking it. So, I mean, yeah. nowadays it's extremely popular. Like, every second person is in it. And don't get me wrong. It's great. It pushes the, the society, the, the, the world to, to go forward. But I think from your perspective of computer science back then, it was definitely not popular, was it? No, it's especially candidly not for, for women. And um, the the program then it was it was you know pretty emerging. They were getting a lot of grants um, to invest you know in the program, the the building that the the classes were held in. You know even when I was there, it moved from the arts and sciences building into the uh, business school building. So that that even shows the progression of of how the curriculum was developing. And I think you know it wasn't that wasn't where you saw the full classes, right? I mean, my largest class, once I declared my major, was, you know, maybe 20 people at Boston College. Oh, wow, yeah. And that's, like, not, you know, that's unheard of, especially now. Exactly. Know? For this field at the end of the day, 20 people, man. I yeah. thought, well, to be fair, the, we were about that many or less showing up to class, but I'm sure there were <laughs> more people <laughs> registered to it just because, of course, the technology of recording and yeah. I'm, I'm sure it wasn't available back then, recorded no, classes no, or anything and, like and, that. No, and I think there was only three women in the class, too. Oh, wow, yeah. So that was, it was, it was, it was very different. It was very different. It was still exciting. You know, the professors were, were fantastic. Um, I still keep in touch with one of them today, but it was, it was different, yeah. That's, it's, it's something that marks you at the end of the day, right? Just like these good influences during that time and mm -hmm. um, even the word pioneering. I think a lot of people just go through a lot of those, I guess, like systems and then just kind of make something out of it. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear it from that. You were mentioning a couple of classes. Um, this is always a moment where I just think back and be like, oh yeah, those database classes, those like algorithm classes, system design classes. And I had one with like graphic vision or something like that where you do a lot of like linear within a framework and everything. So was that pretty straightforward in terms of computer science classes back then? Or was there like a major difference that you could call out? Um, no, I, I think it was pretty similar. You know, the, the you said the word algorithms and like I had to chill down my spine because I took algorithms my second semester of senior year when most, when most people are just finishing up, you know, their core classes, not their major classes. That was a, that was a difficult <laughs> difficult time for me, but no, I, I think I think the, the 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 curriculum you know and the types of classes were, were very similar. You just had less um, lab work, where I think now there's more actual hands-on lab work, and you get you know your projects are different as well, right? They mm -hmm. were more individual projects, where now I think they're more 
lean towards even team building and doing things together, right? The coding is just, it's a different type of curriculum now. No, that actually makes a lot of sense because uh, even one thing I can relate is when I did uh, my undergrad, they, there was such a, a, a kind of blind part to the web world. So for example, like you would take your, your courses that was just listing the algorithm and everything. But there were so little exposure to like web. You, you wouldn't really any do like web languages. You do any of that. So th I feel like that that's something I could call out from like the evolution of like the the courses nowadays. I'm sure it's kind of mandatory to do a bit of web stuff yeah. on that. So. Yeah, it was. That's actually a good point. You know, that was my second job. So I did the computer lab first, and then I, I managed the uh, Boston College website my junior and senior. No way. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember any technologies on there? This is me geeking out in terms of like we we take. React for granted, we take Angular for granted, but how was it back then? Was it just pure like HTML and it was um, it was very um, very HTML focused, boring, <laughs> you know, nothing exciting. Everything had to. I remember going to the office that they set aside for me, and I would just sit there in a the dark room. Um, and now I think about the tools today and the languages, and it was just, it's just so different. It's so different. I'm telling you, but it's so good that <laughs> you could tell the story, or you could like even just like mention those. Mm -hmm. Where even some people, just a step back, like you have like the jQuery, which people always give it crap. They give jQuery so much crap. I kind of get it. It's fine. They give PHP a lot of crap, but then like when you think about very just simple vanilla Don't HTML. Don't forget where you came from. I know. <laughs> and the best part is um, I don't even have any screenshots of that. I think that's what somebody would want to see is like screenshots of the B website from back then of when you were able to, to play around and touch with it. Um, nope. If not, we're going to call somebody out. Anybody who's listening that might have a screenshot, yes. that'd be you. That'd be the uh, <laughs> yes. perfect gift to anybody out there. Um, but one thing that we already dabbled a little, little bit into in terms of like coding languages and all that kind of stuff, like of course the university, right? Java, C++, yeah. like HTML and all that. Was that something that um, you already knew about before going into the program? Or growing up, you've already heard that? I guess, like existence of a programming language or even like yeah. the older school, Fortran, OCaml, like. Yeah, so, so growing up, just because of my, my, my father and, and, you know, the relationship we had with the gentleman I mentioned, the mayor, you know, I, I, I was, I knew of it, you know, I learned the majority of, of you know, um, my background came from college, but, you know, I didn't go in completely cold. Which I think kind of helped me once I was ready to declare my major, mm -hmm. right? Because then I knew, you know, a lot about the foundations at that time, and I think that was the most important part to make me even determine the the career path I wanted to take, right? Even then, when I was in college. I think that's the part that's a very, I guess, relatable to people because it's not an uncommon story where people would hear about languages like here and there as you grew up. Like for me, I remember the first time HTML probably came to and I was like. 14, 15 at school, someone mentioned it, there was like one class that did that. And then you don't hear about it for a couple of years. It will just be like a void of like, yeah. what's that? And then it comes back and it's like, oh wait, you can do so much with it at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. I think that was a part I'm really usually excited about. Um, on record, favorite programming language of all time, including back then, today, whatever. Oh my whenever. gosh, you have to go back to the original Java, come on. I, I respect that. <laughs> it's It's been there for a while for a lot of good yes. reasons at the end of the day. So, um, okay, fine. That is a great thing at the end. Um, and in terms of side projects, people keep on saying this because at school, um, one example I would have is, sure, you have your curriculum. Sometimes part of the course, you'll build a project and it'll, it'll be graded and all that kind of stuff. But was there anything that you caught yourself into, like a rabbit hole, and be like, wait, I want to I wanna do this like for fun at the end of the day? You know, after my robotics class, um, I was there that summer um, as well, not just during the semesters. And um, we took, those, we, we, we took um, those robots and we actually started a soccer tournament with the robots. <laughs> okay, sure. So we Very casually. We did, that, um, we did that the summer of my... Was that sophomore year? I think it was sophomore year. Yeah, and we had some fun. We met once once a week, you know, just kind of geeked out, played a little bit, built our own nets, and it was fun. Oh, my goodness, was, yeah. I mean, that's... that's Lego, all... Legos and C++, what could you... What else could you want? Yeah, that could dominate the world <laughs> at this point. I don't think anything... I didn't think stopping that, so... Oh, man. I think that might be the origin of, like, robot wars, if anything. Um, <laughs> But on the other front, though, in terms of even when you already had a bit of exposure in terms of like just working in tech more professionally, when you're talking about like working with these websites and working with these, um, even at the, the robotics lab and everything, yeah. there's a point where I guess like somebody commits fully in terms of like now that you graduate, now that you're in the real world and everything. 
Do you remember the first time you were fully committed, fully full time, working on tech, getting paid to do tech at the end of the day? Yeah. So、um, outside of those those jobs that I had in college, it, it was kind of an interesting experience. So I、um, tore my rotator cuff my junior year playing softball, so I couldn't go on the、um, summer training trip because I was injured. I had to go to physical therapy.、Um, so because of that, I started applying to internships. And I got an internship at IBM, very randomly. Like you know, went to a job fair, talked with someone, and you know, somehow ended up in New York City with my arm in a sling, having an interview. And、um, got the internship, and I literally went to you know the office in New York City. It was at Five Ninety Madison.、Um, I literally went there the first day, and I remember walking into that atrium, getting my badge, and thinking. This is what I want to do, right? And then I went upstairs, and we started the orientation, and and I watched how IBM taught the way they wanted not only their technology、um, innovated and managed, but also what it meant to IBM as an organization.、Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I think it clicked in my head where I said, "Wow, you know, this is it's so much bigger than what you're learning in school." Right, and and I think you know that that's when I really said I left that day with those two experiences: being in the lobby and then hearing the instructor map the responsibilities to the actual business need. Right. It would it just clicked, and I just loved it. Yeah, I I everybody says internships are valuable, but when you're able to pinpoint where it's like. This is the part that really clicks and makes sense. Like it's a different level of understanding. Yeah, and、right? I think it clicked for me late, candidly. I think you know a lot of a lot of my friends in school, you know, sophomore, junior year, like they they knew what they wanted to do, and I was like, do 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 do, you know.、Um, and I, I enjoyed my coursework and enjoyed college and as, as an experience. But that day, that's when it clicked for me. Well, me and you, to be fair, like <laughs> I feel like I wish definitely there would be more clarity earlier. But at the same time, I think it's it's something that just. Brings you where you are today at the end of the day. If you if you haven't gone through that, you would have never really like figured out. Oh, this is what you like at the end of the day. Not saying that people given the trajectory of being a dentist is not great, but it's also like a very different part、um, to how we compare a lot of that. So,、um, but even IBM back then, of course, it's a it's a household name. Everybody knows. I mean, well, I don't know nowadays, but it's always a fun thing about that. But in terms、mm-hmm. of like, do you remember any fun task that you did during that time?、Uh, that interest there. So my first um, <clears throat> my first project there. Um, I was assigned to a group that was essentially trying to build what is Zoom today. Okay, right. Back in two thousand one, and I worked. He his、um, he was based out of、um, Newport, California. Yeah, Newport, California, and、um, he had developers all over the country. So that was also my first experience with remote work. Mm-hmm. And back then, you were on a conference call, right? And it it was it was his name was Randy Langle. I will never forget him. He was one of the best mentors I ever had. And I remember him saying, "We have a problem. IBM has given us dollars to spend to figure out this problem. I want to be able to see you on the other end when we're having this conversation." And that was that was not only an experience to to see and understand, you know how. Um, you know, people's minds work when they set their mind to get something done at a big corporation. But it was also a way for me to see how you know product plans were developed, how、mm-hmm. you communicate with stakeholders, right? All this stuff you learn in school, but it really doesn't.、Um, it really doesn't resonate until you experience it. Yeah, I will never forget. I will never forget what he said and and working on that as a first project. You did say the word "see you." Like I literally want to see. It sounds so simple at the end of it, right? Yeah, yeah. And then when even my brain is already starting to take to be like, "Where's the camera? How do you plug that into、yeah. it?" And then like, how do you send a lot of that through the waves of the internet and yeah, everything? I remember. I remember his accent and everything. And that was such a you know you have moments that you just never forget, and that was one of them. Of course, and even the word "mentor" you threw out there is that like you need them, not、oh、just、gosh. you.、Mm-hmm. Like you, anybody needs them at the end of the day. And I'm glad that there are these figures that exist in the world and everything.、Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Um, did you end up staying there full time at the end after the internship at IBM or? Yeah, so again, I, I was very lucky. So I, I had the internship, and then、um, they asked me to stay on and do a few hours a week through、um, the whole next year. So I was working like three, four hours a week 
doing like research and you know um, uh, analyst type work uh, from my dorm room in my free time um, and then I did get the offer to work for them full-time um, right before my senior year started mm. so that kind of helped a bit right because I had a little bit of a more relaxed senior year than than um, than some others that was also the year where a lot of um, companies especially being built on tech companies at that time uh, rescinded a lot of college mm -hmm. graduate offers just because of the market at that time um, and I was really lucky because I got to continue so I, I graduated in what was it May uh, traveled a little bit in in June and started in uh, July I mean looking back they they made the right call anyways I think <laughs> looking back um, I think it, it was is a marking moment as we came out saying yeah. it where it's like yeah. the just the reassurance right like you're going yeah. in there with full confidence and then you're able to do what you're excited to do at the end. Um, was it a combination of coding or when you're mentioning analysts, how did that include in that whole mix of like able to, to use your comp sci skills into your day to day? Yeah, your... so that, that was really where I learned um, more product management and research. So I was doing a lot of market research at that time. I was filling in a lot of blanks on some roadmaps and I was actually writing briefings for the investors of this product. Yeah, and that's why I keep on saying it's, it's exciting because there's a Cinderella story. CompSci, best engineer on the planet, you keep on pushing it and you end up being a fellow somewhere. That's like obviously a Cinderella story. But then like the world of tech is massive. You get so mm -hmm. many different paths, like everybody talks about this. So I think in, in the sense of, you know how there's, in the vein of like a software engineer choosing their path, right? They could be like an individual contributor and then you could also be like more on the project management and like engineering management style and everything. For you, like what did your path look like? And I guess how did you make decisions along the way? Yeah. Um... It was the decisions along the way, I think, were a combination of accidents and advice. <laughs> Happy accidents, as they call it. <laughs> Happy accidents. You know, I, when I, I started um, full time at IBM, my first um, customer with IBM was uh, Colgate Palm Olive. Mm -hmm. And um, I was doing their um, you know, website design um, and, you know, a, a few other. Um, small projects that they they had contracted IBM out to do and about two years into that project you know I, I had or that customer engagement I had always had a lot of opportunity to take an additional learning and classes and you know I, I had a mentor at IBM and at, at the end of that two years the um, um, business manager for Colgate Palmolive was going out on maternity leave mm -hmm. and she said hey do you want to try you know and, and get into the management seat of the business here and basically manage the relationship between Colgate Palmolive and IBM and then by default essentially have all of the engineers dotted line into you and while I'm out my first reaction was unfortunately I'm not ready for that and she said stop you know give it a try right and I did, and I think, you know, during that period of time, you know, it was four-ish months, I got a new taste of teamwork, right? Because I had it in college, right, with, with athletics. And then being able to step into that business manager role, I got to see how solving problems and being, bringing someone together was really what I was passionate about just in the technology space. And then when she came back, I continued down the IP, IC path for a few years, um, but eventually came back into management. And that's when I got into, you know, being a manager, um, got into sales a little bit, got into operations, and then went back into, you know, essentially product management. Had a team of engineers where I could, you know, essentially manage a new product and product development, things like that. And, no, it wasn't maintenance at that point in time. It was all innovative and developing new for banking and retail customers after I transitioned out of Colgate. And I just, I never forgot that initial experience of being able to lead the teams. And there goes the career path. I, I keep on, there's a couple words in my head whenever you, that, that's a great story, no mm -hmm. matter what. In terms of, number one, it's more like amplifying others. They're just amplifying, right? A lot of it is that like there's so much you could do as single individuals, but then when your awareness kicks in, it's like, oh, you could amplify so much anything surrounding you. That's probably something that I definitely love hearing. And the other part is just a little push. I think that's like, if, if you think about it, if you look back, obviously, 
looking back at always 2020, but that little push seems so necessary, but it, it needs so much from the other individual to also push you at the end of the day. So mm-hmm. I think those are the parts that, as you were saying, like, oh, yeah, then the rest is like history at that point. It's like mm-hmm. you got these little moments over there that mm-hmm. uh, really puts it all together. So I really do enjoy that. And then when a lot of people think about this, where the IC and the EMs and all the, I guess, like the, these words in technology at the end of the day, um, there's a point where we think about, hey, when do I give up on coding? Because you can't do all of it if you're going to be having so much responsibility. Even for me to think about, what am I doing nowadays? Like, of course, everybody has it in them to be like, I always want to be coding. But then there's also other responses that you also find very fun. How does the project get delivered? How many engineers do you need? How, how long is it going to take? Like, yeah. what's the hurdle? Um, where's the BRD? Where's the PRDs on all that? So I guess from your experience in terms of, was there a defining moment where you were like, I just can't code anymore or not? It's a, I feel like this is a really personal question, yeah. like in terms of how we think about this. Yeah, for, for me, it was probably about, the. it was the year that I left IBM. And I wouldn't, I, it, it wasn't, okay, I can't, or I don't want to, or I, I just I just can't be ingrained in coding anymore, because I, I always I I really do believe like the most successful managers and leaders they understand the foundation and they never lose touch. I think it's really important to never lose touch. Um, but I, I think for you know for me that was when I really decided that I was going to go down, you know, more of the management track, and leaving you know my degree and my work at IBM behind and doing less coding it was like a almost like a crisis of conscience initially mm-hmm. yeah. right because you invested so much time and, and energy and, and even you know with the education in, in, in one space and I think that's why I think it that's another reason why I think it's always important to make sure you don't lose or forget where you came from that I like to say right um, but that was when I, I it changed for me when I left IBM and I went to that startup and you know, it just really opened my eyes to the different ways to elevate other people in a way that helped companies. And I just, like I said before, like never look back. No, of course. I mean, it's all, it's always in you. It's always there. Coding is always going to be there. There's not a, a chance you'll, you'll skip out in terms of being able to, to play around with it. So um, one thing I definitely do want to spend time talking about in terms of CTO, the word CTO. I think that people, people have different journeys on becoming CTO. I mean, like this is just me speculating a lot of that. But it's something that is so valuable to know and have and you know just taking inspiration from so maybe just in a very very general high level what is a CTO what does it even stand for I feel like we we throw this word a lot (laughs) nowadays yeah so I think um you know uh, the the chief technology officer role right it it really is um, it needs to be a very Um, thoughtful mix between uh, communicating direction to the business and also being able to have you know the respect of the folks that are on your team right Um, and no matter where you are kind of like you said you know there's such a different definition of Mm -hmm. the role essentially based on where the company is right I think you know, when, when you, you, you think about the, the types of CTOs that are able to spend, you know, 80% of their time, you know, helping innovate versus, you know, CTOs that are almost forced to help the business, you know, right size and get into a place where the operations are stable before you um, innovate again, it just varies. And I think, you know, the, the most important part of you know the the position that I'm in today is really being that connection or that bridge mm-hmm. between the business and tech, so that the tech is appreciated in a way that continues to kind of survive the life of the business, but also in a way that gives the you know tech resources and employees and our partners yeah. a stage. So it's, it's it's such a balance, especially where I am right now. But there's so many different types of CTOs. To your point. Uh, but I think that the, the the role itself is always responsible for being that bridge. I, I really like how you articulated that, mostly in the sense of like, the one way I look at this, it's kind of crazy, is that, you know, there's a funnel, but then there's a reverse funnel where if you pick like mobile software engineers, you pick them from any company, fairly similar technology, and it's kind of like a, a, a template that kind of works at the end of the day. 
But then once you go a little bit further ahead, where it's like the staff engineers and then like the principal engineers, like it slowly gets a little bit bigger in terms of like what the responsibilities are, right? Yeah. Some of them will be touching architecture, but some of them are just like super doing a lot of research to make sure that this is very, very optimal at the end of the day. And then you can apply the same thing with like managers and then vice presidents and everything of that is that as you go through those levels, it just gets wider and wider. This like reverse funnel that I think about because of responsibility that's, as it goes. That's a great so, way to explain it. Yeah, um, that's a great way to explain it. Yeah. So every time you mention any responsibilities or anything that, anything that a CTO is valuable for, and of course they're definitely valuable for all of that, that makes a lot of sense that one CTO somewhere would be looking at something different than a CTO somewhere else at the end of the day. So. But one thing that I guess like we're all humans at the end of the day, like what are some like day to day like tasks that you got to do? Because I mean, like, for example, I got to eat breakfast every day. I know some people don't. Okay, that's a bad example. But in terms of um, things, is it mostly like day to day meetings or is there like some specific ritual that you, you like being in? Yeah. So so um, I, I love a good routine. <laughs> so, um, you know, day to day when I come in in the morning, so I'm, I'm up fairly early, you know, I, I get in in the morning and. Um, you know, I, I check in essentially with, you know, the leadership team in one way or another, whether mm -hmm. it's folks that are sitting here, whether it's through a Slack channel, you know, whatever it is. I have a, you know, I check in with, with someone just to get a pulse on, on the business. I have a set of reports that I look at that show me, you know, everything from performance to, you know, operational statistics. And I just kind of like settle into the day, um, you know, over the past, you know, eight hours, six hours, whatever it might be in that, in that particular day since I left. So there's like this grounding of the day mm -hmm. that I find very helpful that I never used to do. And it might sound simple, but I used to like run right into meetings at eight or whatever time, right? Or, or 6 a.m. In, in internationally, right? And that, that really wasn't grounding me as a leader into the business. It was just getting me into the day to day, right? So now we have that ritual in the morning. Then you know, what I, I really like to spend the time doing is communicating with the different functions mm -hmm. and making sure that, you know, the perception of technology is essentially as good as we all want it to be, right? Because here and now, that's very important. And then the individual meetings with the team members get me really ingrained in the day-to-day. -day. So I basically start high and then I dive in and by the end of the day, I'm back out again dealing with whatever the day is. Yeah, I, I like hearing this because it's so relatable. When you're talking about the grounding thing where it's like even a dashboard, don't get me wrong, like it's really hard to get a good dashboard. Mm -hmm. Like for any team of knowing the pulse of anything, number one, it's really hard. So that is something that I'm sure it could be its own episode of like, what is your daily dashboard? Mm -hmm. But also it sounds really familiar where um, I know a lot of people have like kind of just a morning to-do list or like just a thing where it just like tells you this is where we're talking today. And like a lot of the, those courses, I keep on saying it's relatable just because it works and just hearing you and your experience how it helps you do your day-to-day -day stuff is very encouraging to know that there's more reasoning as to why people do it mm -hmm. my to-do list is a dot md file mm -hmm. on github that i just version control every day to make sure that there's stuff today and then that's basically how that goes and when do you like when do you do it do you check it out every morning every night like how does that work once in the morning once in the evening there so there's usually two commits a day <laughs> one in the morning that i do yeah. it and it's fun because once in a while like you have the the git history so like you just pull mm -hmm. a random commit from like four years ago and be like, what was I doing at that time? Um, nobody wants to know or see that. Um, but also, I think maybe I skipped this part in the sense of like, how does one become a CTO, I guess? Um, I'll, I'll just throw random words, examples of all of that. CTO founders, you have an idea out of, in college, out of nowhere, you just be like, sure, I'll be the CTO of this and do that. So I think there's a million examples, but I guess from, from your take, um, what is a, I guess, general path to becoming a CTO at the end of the day? Yeah, you know, I think that just to your founder's comment, I think there, there's such a different and important difference in the mentality, right? Like, do, do you want to be that initial creator or do you want to be, you know, the person that inherits and, and either fosters or changes, right? And, and, and I think, you know, based on my background, right, it was, it was almost, um, in this particular case, it was almost... Um, you know, planned out to the minute of being able to inherit, right? Because, you know, I, I had the, the luxury and the good fortune through my mentors and all, all the, the companies that I work for to have the, the software and the infrastructure and the hardware background, right? So, you know, my path, you know, through those companies to the CTO role 
was simply based on everything that I've learned, the people I've worked with, and then the folks that gave me opportunity. Mm -hmm. That That's one of the reasons why I'm so focused on and, and want to make sure that there's enough mentors out there and that everyone's helping someone else, you know, in their career. Because every time I was able to take a step, it was because someone believed in me more than I believed in myself and wanted me to, to take the opportunity. And I think my, my entire career of getting to higher levels in the company was just based off of, you know, reliability, good performance, and the ability to, to, to manage a team. And it, I, it's, it's that simple as long as you have the background, which I was able to get in those, all those areas through my career. And it was, it was a, a, a circumstance of opportunity and, and hard work. I'm, I'm really proud of that, actually. I am more than proud because the way I would put this is making the best out of everything. You said it, you said it maybe a couple of seconds ago in the sense of like, trusting somebody to make the best out of something, it's hard. Right, you you can't take it for granted. But when you're talking about like you don't do this alone, you you need the knowledge around you, you need the mm -hmm. people around you, and you need to be able to connect all of that. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're talking about this position of like seeing what's around and gelling it together, or maybe it's already gelled together, but just like make it better. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's one way of kind of just guiding people in terms of like if you do have those interests, those skills of doing that, that's one path of getting to becoming yep. uh, CTO in that journey at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's, it's so valuable that you share these kind of like, I guess, very simple to understand like events. Because a lot of people be like, oh, it's, it's because somebody like had to do like six years of research into here and then they managed to like plug it into that. And then like, but no, it's just know what you like and just keep on making everybody around you better. And that kind of just leads you yeah. to that journey at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but then this is a random tangent that I hear once in a while is I have seen companies that outsource their CTOs in terms of having contract yep. CTOs. and. What's the difference between that and a consultant? I'm not fully even sure to begin with, but maybe your take on this, whether it's something that you've seen personally, but what exactly is a, I guess, contract worker CTO? Yeah, so, so <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the short answer to the question of, you know, the difference between a, a contractor um, or a CW and a contract CTO, when you, when you simply allow for that title in the position, it, it usually brings um, more senior and more experienced talent for you to hire. So just naming it differently is, uh, is I think, a help. But in reality, it's, it's almost the same thing, right? You're brought on for a finite period of time, usually to solve one problem, mm -hmm. and then it's time for you to move on. Um, it's usually you know, significant, a significant dollar amount to solve some very difficult problem. Maybe not many people want to um, take on and then you have usually have the opportunity to apply for or interview for the permanent CTO um, it's a balance you know because it's it's really hard to get um, employee buy-in in my experience when you're using the word interim mm -hmm. and a lot of times you know you you need to rally the team members to get whatever that interim CTO was brought in to do get it done and it, it's just a different a little bit of a different mindset, it's a bit of a different culture. Um, you know, I, I would always err on the side of a full time, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think there's always a need for someone that's available from a consulting firm to swoop in tomorrow instead of going through a one month interview process. So it has its pros and cons. I'm personally um, supportive of all these different types of roles, but I think it benefits of the company more to, to have full time. Yeah, and this is why I love these opportunities to talk about this conversation in terms of like, not only just the startup world, but the startup world is very flexible, right? Like people have been starting companies even without a main like engineer at the end of the day, right? The people are finding very resourceful. And I have had these conversations where people are like, we don't really have that much tech going on. Should we just have like a contract worker, CTO come in and do that, that kind of stuff? So I feel like this is just hearing it from you, but just anybody who's out there that are thinking about what are the different options? Maybe people didn't even know it existed that could like, have like an outsourced CTO, so I'm, I'm just glad that uh, we had your take on that one. So, um, One thing that I think about a lot in my day-to-day -day is um, tools and software that I use daily. I think that's something that like, I cannot say it's stuff that people just take it for granted. Not everybody takes it for granted, but like there's stuff on my Google Calendar that just works and it's just there. So I guess like just random tidbits of, of fun, I guess, items on your list of tools and software that you use daily. You know what I still use every day? Evernote. 
Okay, fair, yeah. <laughs> um, right? Yeah, but that that's really that's really where I'm at right now. I'm at managing the day to day of my activities mm-hmm. and 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 you know the requirements of this job. There, you know, you you'll find me um, now quite a bit, obviously on Chat G- GPT. Okay, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Um, you're not going to get a, an exciting answer for me out of the tools I use. I'm pretty basic. No, I think what you said is more than exciting at the end of the day. Like, Evernote, why don't you use the Notes app? We'll, we'll figure that part out because there's always the differences <laughs> on that. Um, and even ChatGPT, that's another one that people love diving into in, in the sense of, like, there's always the reluctancy of using a new tool. The only reason why I talk about these tools is that, like, it's they, the good ones disrupt, right? Mm-hmm. The good ones changes your flow to adapt to the tool. I mean, they're not going to market it that way. They'll sure, be like, sure. we just adapt to you. But ChatGPT mentioned that in the sense of like the reliability. I know a bunch of engineers that use it day to day instead mm-hmm. of Stack Overflow, instead of Google nowadays, like ChatGPT. So um, you got any advices for people like starting to dabble into it if they haven't used that as a technology yet? Yeah. You know, I or think, not to use it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's such an interesting um, conversation with, um, you know, our, our, our legal and our privacy teams, right? And I okay. think... I think that it's you know it's really important for anyone using it within any company, right? To to really refer to the company's stance before diving in. <laughs> but I think you know I think in general you know it's those types of inv- advancements are so they're such a wonderful way to speed up a process where someone might have. Um, you know, not develop the skill as, as, as much as others, you know, and, and as an example, you know, it, it's never, it shouldn't be used right now, in my opinion, right, to replace. Mm-hmm. And, you know, using that to, you know, help someone get started on a thought, right, um, you know, take something to the next level and then be able to massage it as your own. I think that's such a benefit that, you know, we should all, you know, consider using. If you want to pass something off as your work, you know, I definitely don't condone that. But I think, you know, putting your voice around, you know, some of the information that it would return is, is so important. Yeah, and it's all about the, I keep on saying, like, that was an educated answer in the sense of, like, there are a lot of factors to determine why you could either agree or disagree with technology. I get shtick sometime for, what is it, GitHub Copilot, where it's mm-hmm. like, I keep on saying that, you should use it probably after three years of professional software engineering. Like, you know what I mean? Like, not that not that you shouldn't use it immediately out of the box, but you should mm-hmm. take it with a grain of salt. Not yeah. everything on there. So that's kind of how I see it. But then there's a point where it's going to get so good that you can literally just use it out of the box. So yeah, we'll that's see. why it's living the, the transition period. And I know for myself, there's always new tools, reluctancy, non-reluctancy. And I'm glad that it's topic that people get to mention mm-hmm. over there. Um, but kind of in the same tangent on that flow, in terms of like, sure, these technologies kind of come into play and obviously some of them cost, some of them don't cost and everything. There's a lot of like investment that we talk about as, a, as an organization, but even as like a single human. So I guess like for a company out there, like what are valuable tech investments for an organization in terms of like, how do you know it's worth spending time doing this? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think it's, it's something that, you know, more companies are, are starting to be more thoughtful about in general. You know the 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 current market conditions don't really allow for you know massive capital expenditure R and D budgets now, right? And and I think you know for for leaders in any space, especially technology, it's important to make sure that you know your um, underlying goals map to what the company is trying to do in, in a particular year. You know, I'd be very surprised if a board of directors or a CEO would say no to some sort of technology investment that would help meet the company's financial goals. And I think, you know, that that's that's a skill, but it's also, it's so much of an art to be able to say, this is what we need to do as a business. Now let's bring the technology along to help us, you know, increase that efficiency and just essentially get things done faster. So I think, you know, the, the ad- advice in general is just to make sure that you, the, the, these functions, especially technology, right, I, like we're talking about, never loses touch with the business mm-hmm. because the money will flow and the investments will come as long as you're doing the right thing for the business. Now, if you're in a startup, right, and you have a, that founder CTO mindset, you make those decisions. But if you're not, you have to make sure you're aligned. Otherwise, you're going to end up spending money that's, you know, not good for anyone. 
Yeah. And everybody wishes that they have the money to spend on every single t- new technology out there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that is another fun topic. But <laughs> yeah, this is more, a, more like a wrap up thought more than anything is what are some, I guess, guiding lights or what are some models that you, you look up to as you become the best gen, if we put it that way? What advices do you have for yourself and what advices do you have for people in general? Wow, that's a that's a good one. I think I think my advice, you know, for people in general is to just remember that whatever they learn, they should pass on to someone else. And I don't mean to belabor that point. And and I know it sounds quite simple, but you know, in 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 the day of you know everybody trying to get ahead, we have to remind everyone that you can't get ahead unless you bring everybody else with you, right? And and I think that that's a simple but really important statement. I, you know, I, I still talk to so many of my mentors, so you know they're they're really my my guiding light, and you know I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of quotes and you know like um, you know motivational things, and no matter what time of day it is actually, and you know one one quote that I always remember is courage is catching, and you know I, I think that's really important because as 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 you you grow in different roles and you become more of a leader or, or a, you know a role model of others it's important to, to make sure that no one forgets where they came from and that in, in the event of the need to make a difficult decision they have support right and I think you know showing courage in anything that you're doing is more important than literally anything else in your career I don't think anybody could have said it better <laughs> I think um, I think if people are looking for quotes there has been plenty 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 throughout this whole <laughs> discussion so I just want to say actually is there anywhere that people could follow you on are you on LinkedIn what's kind of the situation over there? yeah I mean I'm definitely on LinkedIn that's probably the best place right now as we're getting kicked out of this room um, and when something else comes up that I'm working on I'll send it over your way that is amazing we're always <laughs> looking forward to anything that you're doing but once again Jen thank you so much for being on the show thank you This was great. Great to see you. Awesome. And then I'll catch you guys on the next one. Once again, big thank you to Jen for sharing so many amazing stories. If you would like to be on the show, send an email to contact at parity.com. For new episodes, definitely follow the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of your favorite streaming platform. And check out the merch at parity.com slash shop. Thank you again for listening. Big love. I'll catch you on the next one.